Hello everyone and welcome to RC Hacker. My name is Mark and today we're going to be uh, having a look at the OpenLRS system again and I'm going to look at one of the little receiver units, I've got one here, and use it as a spectrum analyzer. So, and I want to test some of the typical FPV equipment using this to see what sort of noise they put out and that sort of thing. So, now it's pretty easy to install you, what you want to do is go to this website here, it's called dtfuhf.com. Now this guy is Canadian and he's building his own um, little open LRS receivers, tiny little four channel units which look really really nice. You know, he's selling them for $35 each and um, good old open source in action, someone in their garage making these and testing them and selling them to the world love it. Now, the guy that's made this, sorry I don't know his name, you'll have to, if, if you're watching this please please tell us your name in the comments below. Um, he's also done a little bit of software. He's got this DTF UHF companion which can be used to do all the settings and stuff on the OpenLRS gear and he's also done this spectrum analyzer which we're going to be having a look at today. So basically you just want to click on this link here now, this is assuming you're using Chrome as your web browser. I'm using Chrome on a Mac here. Um, I presume it works on Windows as well. And basically, just come here and add to Chrome. Checking. And we're done. And then we've got our Spectrum Analyzer tool right there. So, I'm just going to put that in the foreground there. Now it's a pretty basic application, it is a little bit um, touchy now and then but it works works like, works like really well, like sometimes the screen doesn't refresh after you've been using it for a while and I just restart it and then it keeps going. Anyway, so we'll switch over to this other camera here and having a look at, basically this has got the OpenLRSNG version 3 firmware on it, so if you haven't flashed that yet, flash that first because uh, some of the um, settings will not quite apply. Now what you need to do to enable a spectrum analyzer, of course this needs to be programmed as a receiver, and then you want to count your pins. On here I've, I've got all these connected up, I've hardwired these to two servo connectors so they can go on my plane, so just bear with me here. Along here you've got your signal pins, um, typically this is the RSSI and then you've got closer. Typically this is the RSSI and then you've got channel 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. Now uh, in the source code it's more labelled as pin 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. You want to short together pins 3 and 4. So you want to, what you typically need is these little um, hard drive jumpers are quite handy. If you open up any old computer you can always steal one out of there. Um, be aware it might change your settings, but yeah. Now, so you want to short those two out, and in this case, I, do, I just have to put, I'll just put this little bit of wire in here and short those two out. So that's pin three and pin four together, or you could call it channel two and channel three. Just put those together. Now, when this boots up, when I apply power, now in this case, I've got um, just an, an old blown up. ESC, I'm just using the 5 volts off it to power it, and when you power that up, the LED should flash and then no LED should be lit. It basically means it's ready for um, the spectrum analyzer mode. Now you will need an FTDI or some sort of um, serial to USB converter. In this case I'm using the FTDI. Because I'm applying power down here, I've got the power disconnected. Um, as said before in the flashing instructions, you don't ever want to connect this with 5 volts, okay? Just uh, 3 volts there. If you're connecting 5 volts here on, on the um, RC input pins, that's fine because then that goes via the regulator here and supplies the rest of the board with 3.3 volts. The little module on the back of these, the RFM22, cannot handle any more than 3.3 volts. So, that's disconnected. 
uh, we want to line up our for our RX and TX and then we want to line them up with the ones on the back there like so now our FTDI program is connected and lastly connected in to a USB on our computer now going back to the screen over here click refresh here and then hopefully if it's all connected you should have USB serial pop up so we can select that and then click connect now wait for it alright we're in business it's doing something okay so now we want to pick uh, which frequencies we want to scan, what, what we're interested in looking at. Now just, we're going to be looking around the 435 megahertz, but just just worthy of noting that the RFM 22B, this is the RFM 22B data sheet here, is capable of um, going from 240 megahertz all the way up to 960 megahertz. That's for receiving I'm not, not too sure about transmitting on all of those, but it's got a huge range range of frequencies that this can actually um, detect. So that means our little spectrum analyzer is good for 240 right up to 960 megahertz, which is really quite interesting. Now you'll notice at the moment we're going from 425 to 435 megahertz. It's not updating every single time. So if we just change one of those slightly we'll notice that it scans across and then it keeps updating itself that's just because it's in sync with what it's now after you've entered your first values in here it's now in sync with what's being sent by the uh, receiver module over here what frequencies are we interested in let's go across here now this is just a screenshot from when I was configuring my uh, rate my 9x radio previously from when I was configuring the transmit module and what I, what I did I manually selected the hop channels here so I went from 0 5 10 15 20 up to 50 now typically when you do an automatic bind it'll randomly pick by default six different channels but in this case I've manually selected 11 different channels and space them all out just so we can see them easier on the spectrum analyzer um, look at our base frequency it's 435 megahertz and then our cha channel spacing pretty sure that relates to 50 kilohertz so 5 by 5 is well 5 by 50 is 250 kilohertz so from 0 from um, channel 0 to channel 5 goes, goes up that much and you can see our frequencies there of each of the channels that we have so we're interested in a range of about 435 megahertz up to 437.5 megahertz so let's go back here for the purpose of this this test what we're going to select I'm going to start with 430 megahertz there and then 439 and I'm going to select a thousand samples and we're going to do it in 10 kilohertz steps Let's see how that works so you can see it's scanning across here it's not particularly fast you need to be pretty patient with this you're not going to see instant results like on a little RF Explorer or something like that but we've got a nice this is our basic noise floor now keep in mind I'm right near the computer okay so I guess the first thing we should do is I've got this on quite a long USB cable and I'm just going to take it away and stick it in this Faraday cage Right, there we go, got our lid off. So inside I've just got a bit of foam so I don't short anything out. And we'll just pop this in here. There we go, she's inside there. We'll just pop that in there and we'll see 
what our noise floor is like. Putting the lid on now. Now keep in mind there may be some noise coming in on the lines on your power and your USB cable as well. So this is just an attempt at, at a baseline. We'll let that scan all the way across. And I'll pause that there and now we'll compare what we've just scanned of it in the pot with what it was beforehand outside the pot and we'll see if there are any differences there. Obviously I'm going to do this in post. So this is inside the pot and this is outside the pot and we're just going to flick between the two. And you can see that the noise floor inside the pot is, is uh, decreased substantially there. Um, interesting to note the two peaks on the left hand side they, they've sort of maintained the amplitude and perhaps that indicates that, that those peaks are coming off the actual USB cable or the computer or something like that. Not sure but you know it's interesting anyway. Okay moving on. Okay so let's try and we'll turn on our radio keeping in mind that it's sitting inside the pot so let's do that. Turning on the radio now. There we go, she's on. Now we can see the difference there and we can see our our points here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So there are our 11 channels that I'm hopping on. So if you can see see our, our where we're working and we know that our receivers are working in there. Now, what I'll do now, I'll go and take this and put it outside and just put it a bit of a distance away. And we'll see what the difference is. So I was right over the top of this. So who knows, you know, maybe this whole pot was resonating because it was, the antenna was right on top there. Let's have a look. We've still got our channels, we've still got our nine channels there. And um, yeah, so that's our baseline. So that's with the transmitter on and that's with the transmitter off. And that's with the transmitter on and it quite close, like sitting almost directly above the pot and it's you know way too much signal there and noise from the transmitter so we'll just ditch that and now this is the signal cycling now you can see you can clearly see where the um, transmitter is operating on on those 11 hopping channels now of course um, if you do the random binding setup those channels will be spaced out a little bit differently and not so evenly spaced as I've put them here. Anyway, so you know what it looks like on and off. Let's move on. So that's our, you know, basic noise floor inside the pot. And I'll take it out again and we'll just go back to our noise floor floor outside the pot. Now now what I'm gonna do, we're gonna just test it against some typical FPV equipment. What I'll do first, I've got here, I've got a 1.2 gigahertz Lawmate 500 milliwatt transmitter. So I've got got this here. I've got a battery, and we're just going to power it up and see if there's any difference there. So let's do that. I'll just note that this is a three cell battery. That's not quite fully charged. So that's around 12 volts. And we'll hook that up. So, and now let's have a look at the difference as it scans across. Okay, so that's scanned across completely. Let's have a look at our baseline and see what it's like. So that's the Lawmate off and then the Lawmate on. Now we can see that the noise floor has it's come up a fair bit. Um, it's interesting that it's smoother, but the noise floor has definitely come up a fair bit. And then the, there's that spike in the middle there. 
um, whether that's actually the Lumate transmitter or it's uh, another artifact picked up in the previous scan uh, I'm not sure we're not I'll have to do it again to be 100% sure with that one now what I'll do I'm gonna move this just away a little bit um, just to simulate what the spacing would be on an airplane because it's right next to that there then just move it away not too far because I'm only gonna move it apart maybe oh shot just shorted something now something just smoked Okay, we're still good, we've still got a voltage. So I've, I've moved, that, moved that aside now, so it's got a little bit of a spacing and we'll just let that scan across. So that's our spacing there, we'll compare that to the baseline. So that's the law made off, and that's with it on, a foot away, and you can see there's not much difference in that at all. There is, you can see that little small spike at about 435 kilohertz is going up a little bit but that won't affect the LRS system and you know just a little bit of spacing there makes a whole lot of difference now let's compare let's put on the um, with it really close again let's let's compare that again so with the the close scan on there you can see that little spike is actually coming from the um, lawmate but I don't think that'll make a lot of difference that tiny artifact and if you just give it a little bit of spacing just a foot you know it's pretty quiet so I don't expect any problems from this so I'd have to say at that distance that's fairly good now next up I was going to try out this 2.4 gigahertz 500 milliwatt transmitter it was a cheapo Hobby King one. I've actually tested this out and it only seems, with the receiver I've got, it only seems to work on one frequency. But um, I haven't actually tried it out in anger in the field yet. Now, let's just hook this one up and we'll see what we've got. Making sure I've got the polarity right double checking it in my mind at all times okay so the antenna is quite close to the receiver there and apply power now I'll compare that against our baseline so that's off and that's with it on and you can see there's a uh, few extra spikes at 431, 432 and then 436 as well and the noise floor doesn't come up a huge amount but it does come up a fair bit uh, that's close and now I'll just move it I'll just put that just in frame there Not a... now I shouldn't have moved that I'll explain why in a little bit huge distance away from each other just a reasonable distance and we'll do another test see how that compares with our baseline not really close well let's compare that one with the baseline now that's with 2.4 off and that's with it on spaced at one foot but you will remember I moved the receiver and that basically makes this test invalid because I probably moved the receiver closer to another noise source which is the laptop so will disregard this test right now finally I'll just let that clear once again okay so we have a baseline for the GoPro let's turn him on and we'll see what we get now you can see there are a couple of extra spikes there um, there's quite a little bit of noise coming out of this GoPro just just a couple of spikes oh you'll notice I, I just moved it and there's a whole lot more come up let's let that scan again I'll sit it like that now we're very close to the antenna here and we can see that it's significantly more noise just from going from that to that now I'll move the GoPro and yes I've moved the receiver again but don't worry uh, 
at the end I do another another test with the GoPro off. So let's keep moving on. And the end, the receiver there apart a bit, and we'll just let that scan across, and we'll see what the what the interference is like at a reasonable distance. So yes, they're still there now. Okay, now let's turn it on and start recording and see if that changes anything at all to the noise that's output by the GoPro. It seems one of those bikes has gone up slightly after I turned it on. And I'll turn it after I started a recording, sorry. I'll turn it off again and we'll just let that scan through and see what our difference is. What you can see is it's scanning across there, it's a significantly lower noise floor. Still a couple of spikes in about the same place, but the GoPro seems to make those spikes stronger. Maybe it's a typical um, frequency for a, some sort of switching power supply or something that's inside the computer as well. But you can see that above 435, our noise didn't change that much with the GoPro, so it may not affect our, um, our transmission too much, but certainly below that, it, it's not completely silent. So let's have a look again in post. That's with it off and on, and with the GoPro recording, and we'll cycle through. Remember, these are all done at the same distance without moving the receiver, and you can see that off the noise floor is yeah it's a little bit lower and then when the GoPro is on there are a couple of extra spikes there at around you know below 433 but ab above above with our working frequency it doesn't seem to make much difference so in summary what we've done we've tested some typical video transmitting gear next to the OpenLRS system and it seems that uh, this one doesn't make too much noise, 1.2 gigahertz more mate, but um, this one here does make a little bit. I'm, I'm going to be doing some of these comparisons in post because it's much easier just to uh, switch between the two scans and compare them, so maybe I've messed up this summary a little bit. But definitely the GoPro outputs a little bit of noise. Not not above 435 megahertz, but below 435, just below, it does put out a little bit of noise. And I have heard people, like, they pull these apart and then they put a nice um, copper jacket on the inside of the case so you can just wrap the whole thing in aluminium foil or something to achieve the same thing. So um, I suspect short range stuff you won't notice a difference, but extremely long range, you want to you know, wrap your camera up. Uh, there are other cameras out there that are really notorious for putting out a lot of noise. Anyway, cheers. That's a little bit of practical on how to use the Spectrum anal Analyzer. And uh, cheers, thanks for watching. If you like this, please give me a big thumbs up. If you didn't, give me a thumbs down and uh, please subscribe.